thank you so much for joining us today at our IP Osgood Speaks series. I'm Professor D'Agostino, and I'm the founder and director of IP Osgood. That's Osgood's flagship IP and tech program. Now, if you haven't already done so, I do encourage you to go to iposgood.ca, which is our website where you can see all that is new and exciting in IP here in Canada and around the world. And on the website, you will have a blog already up there by our guest speaker today so that you will have a chance to continue the conversation from today, put your comments, questions, and also go visit our Facebook page and LinkedIn where we have today's event uh, posted. Now, feel free to tweet away uh, at uh, hashtag IPOsgoodSpeaks. And I'd like to thank, of course, everyone that's really uh, helping organize the IP Osgood Speak series. And we start with our founding law firm sponsors, Castles, Gowlings, and McCarthy's. I'm also grateful to our Associate Dean of Research, newly minted, Professor Karis Craig, who is also an IP expert in her own right for her generous support of our speaker series. And the entire logistical team, Michelle Lee at the back. She is the assistant director of IP Osgood. And Mary Barbieri as well, who is also working on the logistical team and is assistant to IP Osgood. So a big round of applause to all of our supporters. <laughs> now, as many of you know, and for those of you joining us online, as this event is being recorded, and the recording will be uploaded onto the IP Osgood site. IP Osgood really aims to inject many more voices to the IP debate and intensify the learning opportunities for our students. And today's event is no exception. Uh, we're in a very privileged position today to have with us um, our guest speaker. Uh, she is one of the global leaders in the IP community. And I'm actually very excited because it's been very hard to get Professor Jane Ginsburg, yes, to come to Osgood because if you look at her calendar, it's crazy. It's double booked. It's it's uh, packed all over the place. And the only way we were able to get her here is that I got to see her at a conference in California, and I got her to sit down. And we looked at her calendar, and we found that that opening of a day to to get her to come. So here she is with a warm welcome. We're very glad you're here. Professor Jane Ginsburg is the Morton Janklau Professor of Literary and Artistic Property Law at Columbia University School of Law, and she's also the faculty director of its famous Kernokan Center for Law, Media, and the Arts. She teaches in legal methods and copyrights and trademarks and has authored books in all of these areas. She uh, has a book called Copyright Concepts and Insights with Professor Robert Gorman, with Professor Sam Rickinson, uh, one called International Copyright and Neighboring Rights, the Berne Convention and Beyond, and there's lots beyond, right? Lots beyond Bern, And of course, many other books on volumes on domestic and international copyright and trademark law. With Professor Dreyfus and Professor Desmonte, she was a co-reporter for the American Law Institute Project on Intellectual Property, Principles Governing Jurisdiction, Choice of Law, and Judgments in Transnational Disputes. Now I have to say, on a personal note, I'm a very big fan of Professor Ginsburg. She, for me, is one of the few scholars in the US, and there are many scholars in the US, we know that, um, who looks outside of the US for a comparative lens. And I think this is very important. And we see this in her scholarship, which I draw a lot on in my own work, and also as recent as that famous conference we went to where you had all the who's who in IP in the US, and she was the only one that mentioned a country other than the US at a conference that was talking about copyright reform. Imagine that, you're trying to reform the U.S. Copyright Act, and you don't look outside of the U.S. But of course, Professor Ginsburg brings that perspective to all of her work and to all of her discussions. Now I have to say that this is matched when you look at her schooling and her affiliations. So she's a graduate of the University of Chicago, where she got a BA in 1976 and an MA in 1977. Then she went on to get a JD from Harvard, 1980. 
and a diploma from the Etudes Approfondies in 1985 and a doctorate of law in 1995 from the University of Paris too. Now she's a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, a member of the American Philosophical Society, and an honorary fellow of Emmanuel College, University of Cambridge. I'm really happy we actually have someone from the other school because we, quite, we had a few Oxford uh, speakers in the last few uh, speaker series. So very happy to have you with us, Professor Ginsburg. She's gonna speak for about 45 minutes, after which point we look forward to having a uh, discussion with all of you and hearing your comments and questions. So with that, a very warm welcome, Professor Ginsburg. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor D'Agostino. Thank you, Dean Sassen. Uh, I, I, should I disclose that we go back uh, an undisclosed number of years uh, when, when, uh, when Lorne, uh, freshly off the Supreme Court of Canada, came to Columbia as an associate in law uh, and uh, was assigned to me. So, and we had two very good years together. Uh, and the case book still bears the stamp of some of your hypothetical questions. So uh, I'm not sure I'm going to talk for 45 five minutes. I think in this some uh, int intimate gathering, we can uh, maybe have more Q&A and, and less formal setup, but some formal setup uh, none, nonetheless. So the, uh, the topic is the making available right, which is a hot topic in Canada as well as in the United States. And it is an international topic. Uh, we are uh, in the United States uh, in the midst of talking about law reform. I can't say that we're doing law reform and it's not clear if we actually will do law reform. Uh, in that vein, however, I should put in a plug for a conference this coming Friday at Columbia, which I think will be available on the net. I'm not sure if we're uh, live streaming or will provide a link to the recorded proceedings, but we are, to my knowledge, the only uh, academic or other institution in the United States to have decided uh, and to be implementing a, uh, a conference on law reform from the perspective of authors and performers, since everybody else's law reform seems to have forgotten about the authors and performers. And we, at Columbia, we still think that if you don't have authors and performers, well, then you don't have any of the rest of it. So uh, law reform form from the perspective of authors and, uh, and performers. Uh, th this topic, the uh, making of available right, concerns the United States uh, uh, always uncertain relationship with its international obligations in copyright. The making available right is not the only instance of an international norm that the United States may not have fully implemented. I can say that we're doing better on the making available right than we are on moral rights, which we have essentially not implemented at all. So this is a, a step in the right direction. Uh, but the, the specific question that this talk is about is whether as a result of the decision at the end of the last term uh, at the Supreme Court, the Aereo decision, whether the United States is any closer to implementing the making available right to the full extent of our obligation to do so. I will say that if the Supreme Court had held the other way, we would have been uh, quite far away from uh, honoring our international obligations. So it's a happier talk than it might have been had things gone differently, but there is sufficient ambiguity as to the scope of the Supreme Court's holding that I, I think that we can all speculate uh, together afterwards uh, about whether the United States now uh, is uh, respecting its international obligations. So what is the international obligation? This is the text, uh, relevant text of Article 8 of the WIPO Copyright Treaty, which builds on the Berne Convention, specifically Article uh, 1111 bis and uh, other articles concerning the right of communication to the public in the Berne Convention, has been updated for the internet in the 1996 WIPO Copyright Treaty uh, because it states the right of communication to the public as including 
the making available to the public of their works in such a way that members of the public may access these works from a place and at a time individually chosen by them. So this is about on demand. Uh, it's about so-called pull technologies as opposed to the traditional push technologies. Before the internet, uh, there wasn't that much in the way of on-demand, although it certainly was uh, on the horizon and you, you could have a limited form of on-demand through cable uh, transmission services. But the primary way of communication to the public by means of transmission was so-called push technologies, that is the broadcaster or the cable transmitter uh, had programming and sent it to you. The only role that you played was turning on the television or turning on the radio uh, and then selecting among the channels, but you didn't get to select specifically what work or what time. Today, with so-called pull technologies, that's exactly what you do. So whatever you want to watch or listen to, whenever or wherever. And in 1996, the WIPO Copyright Treaty was enacted to uh, ensure that the right of communication to the public would cover these new modes of communication. One question that has arisen is whether the right of making available is that is, is the right triggered simply by offering to transmit the content on demand, or is, has the right not actually been called into play until somebody has made the request and that the transmission has actually occurred? I think that it's pretty clear from the text of Article 8 itself, members of the public may access, that we're talking about potential transmissions, not uh, exclusively actual transmissions. And uh, recently, just this, this year, the European uh, the Court of Justice for the EU uh, interpreted their directive, which enacts Article 8 verbatim, uh, to make quite clear that it is not necessary to show that there has been an actual transmission of a work. Making available means what it sounds like, may access, irrespective of whether the members of the public avail themselves of that opportunity. Uh, so keep that in mind, that, that the making available right uh, includes not only actual transmissions, but the offer to transmit, because we will come back and inquire whether the U.S. law, is, uh, the as interpreted, is uh, consistent with that understanding of the making available right. In 1996, at the time of the adoption of the making available right in Geneva, at the WIPO copyright treaties, the question came up, well, how is this right going to be implemented in national law? Is it necessary for member states to enact something called the making available right, or could the, uh, the rights and the economic interests that are uh, comprised within the making available right uh, be implemented through uh, other heads of exclusive rights, such as the right of public performance, uh, the right of distribution to the public for those countries, notably the US, that considered that the distribution right covers not only hard copies, so material copies, but also digital distribution. In fact, most countries consider that the distribution right concerns hard copies and that, the, uh, that digital distribution is a form of making available. So making available, if we go back to the text, if I can, yes. Uh, the right of uh, authorizing to any communication to the public of their works. So whether the works are delivered as a download or whether the works are delivered as a stream, either way, they come within the making available right. So uh, in most other countries uh, and in the European Union, the distribution right only concerns hard copies. But that is not the case, as we will see in the United States. Uh, to enhance the, the prospect of ratification of the WIPO copyright treaties, it was agreed that member states could 
implement the making available right either through a right by that name or through some combination of other rights. The United States approach to treaty implementation uh, is known uh, as the minimalist approach and that's Congress's own term. So this, this is not an epithet. This is Congress's stated way of, of implementing at least copyright treaties, which is to do the absolute minimum possible to change the extant copyright law. The United States took the position in the treaty negotiations at Geneva that it wasn't necessary for the United States to come up with a new making available right or amend its copyright laws because the combination of the public performance and distribution rights got to the same place. And what we care about is substance, not form. So it doesn't really matter that we don't have something with the title making available as long as we are covering the full range of what the making available right covers, which is downloads and streams, not only actual delivery, but offers to deliver the content as downloads or streams. So this so-called umbrella solution, which was adopted at Geneva, was, uh, if not specifically at the behest of the United States, certainly it worked out very well for the United States that uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, treaty negotiators in Geneva took the position that the making available right could be implemented in a variety of ways. And so when the United States ratified the WIPO copyright treaties, uh, the position taken was it is not necessary to amend the copyright law because we've already got it covered. But maybe we don't. The, uh, there are two problems with, as it has turned out, with taking the position that it wasn't necessary to have a making available right per se, that we already covered it through a combination of other pre-existing exclusive rights. Uh, and those two problems are Congress and the courts. That is the actual words of the Copyright Act on the one hand, uh, and uh, a, a graver problem, as we will see, how the courts have been interpreting those words. So let's talk first about the distribution right. The, this is the text of section 106.3 of the Copyright Act. Section 106 sets out the exclusive rights of the copyright owner. And the first is to reproduce the work in copies or phono records. The second is to, the, to authorize derivative works. And the third is to distribute copies or phono records to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership or by rental lease or lending. So the question arose whether or not you could have given this text digital distribution, that is distribution of a work in a dematerialized form, not a hard copy, but rather sending somebody a digital file, because in the digital context, there isn't a transfer of ownership if what we mean by transfer of ownership is that the person who is distributing the copy uh, divests herself of her copy. In other words, if I'm selling a book, I sell the book, Professor D'Agostino has the book, and I no longer have the book. I have transferred uh, ownership of my copy and I don't own it anymore. But that's now ha not how it works in the digital world. In the digital world, I can send any number of copies and still have my copy. I would have to affirmatively delete my copy but that by deleting the copy doesn't have anything to do with my sending out all of those copies. So uh, the, the argument was made that the term transfer of ownership implies a divestiture on the part of the person doing the distribution and therefore you, there's no such thing as digital distribution at least di distribution dematerialized form. You can distribute uh, a work in digital format like a CD, but that's a hard copy. Uh, just, just that the format is, is a digital format, but you're still distributing a physical object as opposed to sending a digital file. Our courts, however, and indeed our statute in other places, have come to the conclusion that you can have a transfer of ownership uh, and digital distribution. Uh, there are a number of points in the statute where the statute refers to the delivery of digital files, the phrase digital phonorecord delivery. Uh, 
So uh, Congress has acknowledged the possibility that you can have uh, a reproduction and distribution of copies or phono records of the work without there being a material copy. And courts have also recognized that what counts is not really where, whether the distributor, the sender of the copy, no longer has her copy. What counts is whether the, uh, the person to whom the copy is destined ends up with a copy. So uh, the courts have said that transfer of ownership, what that really means is creating new ownership in the hard drive of the recipient of the copy, regardless of whether the sender of the copy still has her copy. And uh, I like to, in talking about uh, transfers uh, uh, of, of ownership, I like to refer to a um, okay, a bi biblical example uh, in which uh, uh, the, at the Sermon on the Mount, and a variation on this story is in all four Gospels, uh, at the Sermon uh, of, on the Mount, the public was hungry, so Jesus told the disciples to distribute the loaves and the fishes. And they said, but we've only got these few baskets and there's not enough loaves and fishes for everybody in, in, in attendance. And uh, they were, the, the uh, apostles were nonetheless instructed to distribute the loaves and the fishes. Miraculously, there were enough loaves and fishes for everybody at the Sermon on the Mount. And we are told in all four Gospels that at the end of distributing all of those loaves and fishes, this, the original number of loaves and fishes remained in the baskets at the end of the process. Right? So that is digital distribution. <laughs> Uh, no question that, you've, that there has been a distribution, even though the uh, originator of the distribution still has the original number of copies or objects. Okay, so the, the courts uh, and Congress have, have not really had a, pro a, a big conceptual problem with saying that the distribution right covers the dematerialized and it is not necessary to have a divestiture of ownership in order to create new ownership of a digital file, a copy, a fixed copy uh, in somebody else's computer. But the second question that came up and that is particularly pertinent to the making available right is uh, it has a dis distribution occurred only when somebody ends up with the copy uh, or is the offer to make available, the offer to send the copy, the offer to create a copy in somebody else's computer, uh, is that, does that suffice to trigger the distribution right? Uh, and uh, under the making available right at the international level and in the EU, it's clear that the right covers not only the actual distribution, but the offer to distribute. But in the United States, our case law is kind of all over the place. Uh, and we have had one case that has said that uh, the distribution right encompasses the right of publication, and the publication right is uh, defined as including offers to distribute copies of works. So if publication can includes offers to distribute and publication is a form of distribution, then distribution includes offers to distribute. That's kind of the syllogism that drove the Electra case. Uh, but other courts didn't buy that. So uh, two other courts have said you have to have actual distribution. And in the statutory context of digital phono record deliveries, I think the premise there was that the the, the sound recordings in phono records were delivered and the statutory royalty is based on the delivery of the, the copies. Uh, so two other courts, all of these are district courts, we don't have even yet uh, an appellate court weighing in on this, uh, have said that you have to have uh, actual distribution. But Judge Gertner in the uh, District of Massachusetts who wrote, I think the most uh, thoughtful and extensively reasoned opinion of all of the courts that have addressed this said that we, you can nonetheless presume that the distribution has occurred. This was in a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing controversy. Uh, and she wrote that if the putative distributor has done everything to set up the distribution and all that remains to be done is for the 
recipient, the potential recipient, to push a button to get the copy, we will presume that some recipient out there pushed a button, and therefore the burden shifts to uh, the defendants to show that, that there was an offer, but nobody accepted that offer. Uh, the, uh, and then in the Capital Records Against Thomas case, this is the Jamie Thomas case, which is notorious on account of the amount of statutory damages that was awarded uh, by successive juries ever more. Um, the, uh, the court held that you have to have actual distribution and rejected Judge Gertner's approach that you could have deemed distribution, that you would have to show actual distribution uh, so there's no such thing as a making available right if making available means simply to offer. Now, in the Jamie Thomas case, it was argued that uh, we should interpret, to the extent that there's any ambiguity, we should interpret our statute consistently with the international norm. This is a public international law doctrine known in the United States as the Charming Betsy Doctrine, but I think most countries have some variation of this doctrine, which is uh, if where the, where the domestic statute is unclear, you should interpret it consistently with the international norm. So avoid having a conflict with uh, the international norm. And the, uh, the District of Minnesota, somewhat surprisingly, I think, rejected the application of the, of the Charming Betsy Doctrine on the ground that it thought that the law was clear in the Eighth Circuit that distribution requires actual distribution. I'm not so sure that the law was clear in the Eighth Circuit, but it is true that the Charming Betsy Doctrine uh, comes into play when there is an ambiguity. Uh, if there is no ambiguity, then, uh, we will be in violation of our international uh, obligation because the domestic norm trumps the international obligation until such time as Congress amends the statute if the statute is so clearly inconsistent with the uh, international norm. Uh, uh, the alternative, of course, is if we are not living up to our international obligations, there may be a sanction uh, in some other forum, but not for the WIPO copyright treaties. Uh, let me open a parenthesis and explain. Uh, the, the Berne Convention, which is the, the great edifice of international copyright, uh, had one major shortcoming, which is it did not have an enforcement mechanism. So you could ratify the Berne Convention and then not really implement it. And the United States uh, is kind of rogues gallery or exhibit A uh, in that, uh, because the Berne Convention requires member states to protect not only authors' economic rights, but also their moral rights. But we don't really protect authors' moral rights. Um, but that's okay, because if we were not um, living up to the Berne Convention, there was really nothing that could be done by way of retaliation. There was another Berne Convention norm that we also did not initially implement, and that is the requirement that when a member state joins the Berne Convention, any works from other Berne states that are in the public domain prematurely in the United States uh, or in the newly joining country that are still under copyright in their countries of origin have to be restored to copyright in the newly joining state. And this was a big issue for the United States because we had a lot of formalities that most other countries didn't have anymore. And so there were a lot of foreign works that fell into the public domain in the United States because they did not comply with the notice requirement or the requirement to register and renew the copyright after 28 years. The Berne Convention, Article 18 says, you join the Berne Convention, you have to play by international rules, put these works back into copyright. We were not eager to put works back into copyright. The public domain is an important principle. So we just didn't implement Article 18 and we could get away with it because the, there was no uh, enforcement mechanisms. That changed, however, uh, when the United States uh, and Europe and Japan all pushed to put intellectual property into the World Trade Organization framework. And one of the reasons that we did that was that we wanted the Berne Convention to have teeth. The, uh, the problem was that our trading partners weren't always 
respecting our copyrights. And we thought that maybe if trade sanctions, possibly it, with respect to goods that weren't intellectual goods, but goods which might matter to the economies of those countries, if you could levy tariffs on those, uh, those goods, that would encourage those countries to come into line. The only problem is that when then we had also to live up to our obligations to the extent that the uh, the TRIPS agreement made those obligations enforceable and it made Article 18 enforceable. So we did belatedly restore copyrights and as you may know that went all the way up to the Supreme Court on the question of the, the public, public domain. But we still haven't implemented moral rights and we haven't implemented moral rights because the uh, TRIPS Accord makes all of the Berne Convention enforceable in a trade dispute proceeding except for moral rights. So we can continue to do what we're doing or not doing in the realm of moral rights. Well, what about the making available right? That's clearly an economic right. But the making available right came in with the 1996 WIPO Copyright Treaty, TRIPS is 1994. So the making available right, at least the WIPO Copyright Treaties, are not enforceable through TRIPS. You would have to argue that the making available right is a clarification of the communication to the public right. The communication to the public right is in the Berne Convention, and therefore if we don't implement the making available right, then we are uh, violating not only the WIPO copyright treaties, but also the Berne Convention. I think that's going to be a difficult argument to make, because there was enough ambiguity about the scope of the right of communication to the public that there's, it's at least a defensible position that the WIPO copyright treaties are burn plus, and TRIPS doesn't go beyond burn apart from any provisions that are TRIPS specific. So if we're not implementing the making available right, uh, we, there is not an international sanction unless we can somehow restate, or we, our challengers, can restate that as being part of the Bern Convention. So back to Capitol Records against Thomas, uh, the District of Minnesota says Charming Betsy doesn't apply because it's our, our, uh, in the, at least in the Eighth Circuit, there's no ambiguity. You have to have actual distribution. That is inconsistent with the uh, making available right, but if the making available right uh, isn't incorporated into US law and there's no international sanction for not uh, implementing the making available right, then that's an unhappy state of events, but the, in effect, the United States gets away with it. Obviously, uh, nobody really wants to say that as baldly as I've just said that. We would like to say that we are implementing the making available right. The, uh, both the Copyright Office and the PTO have, taken, have acknowledged that there has been disarray with respect to the distribution right piece of the making available right, but uh, they both uh, have expressed the hopeful interpretation that courts henceforth will get it right and that there has been subsequent scholarship, a magisterial article by Peter Minnell, uh, showing that Congress did, in 1976, intend the distribution right to cover not only actual distribution, but offers to distribute. So that's the distribution piece, or the download piece, of the making available right. I, I think that perhaps the United States will bring itself in line, but I can't say uh, definitively by any means that the United States has fully implemented the making available right on the distribution right side. At least uh, it, it remains unclear whether offers to distribute as well as actual distributions uh, come within the scope of the right. Okay, what about the other piece of the making available right? The public performance right. So public performance right it comes in two pieces, to perform and to perform publicly. So this is the statutory definition of to perform a work. And this, uh, the significance of this uh, may become clear, clearer um, a little later, but uh, one thing that uh, should, should be clear from this language is that there is a difference uh, transported to the internet between a download and a stream. 
a download is sending a file, a static file, the work is not being rendered as it is delivered. So a download doesn't come under the public performance right. Uh, it comes under the reproduction and distribution right. A stream, the work is unfolding and is perceptible as it is being communicated. That comes within the public performance right. That's, that's within perform. But what about the public part? So we have a two-pronged definition of to perform publicly. One is to perform in a place open to the public. The part that is of most interest in this context is the so-called transmit clause. That is to the language you have, to transmit or otherwise communicate a performance or display to the public by means of any device or process. So Congress in 1976 was trying to look forward towards un technologies even unknown in 1976, whether the members of the public, so now we're ta not talking about uh, a group, a large group of people assembled in a place open to the public. We're talking about the members of the public, which may actually encompass a small number of people, but those people are receiving their, the work in their capacity as members of the public because the work is offered to the public, or at least to a public um, that consists of persons who have no relationship to each other or to the work, even if they're not necessarily a very large number of people. So if there may be some uh, uh, obscure Estonian rock star who has a public, even though that public, at least outside of Estonia, may be r rather modest nonetheless to uh, uh, to transmit those works, uh, or, or as I will contend to offer to transmit those works, uh, to the, 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 the fan base, that's to, to the public. Uh, whether the members of the public capable of receiving the performance or display receive it in the same place or separate places, but that's been true since the days of radio. The uh, innovation in the 1976 Act, which is echoed in the text of the Making Available Right, is uh, in separate places, uh, uh, excuse me, and at the same time or at different times. This is the on-demand part. This is asynchronous transmissions, and the members of the public can receive the transmission where, when and where they are. So that's, that covers, and the legislative history makes it clear that Congress really was anticipating user-initiated on-demand transmissions of works. So one might say that the 76 Act anticipated the making available, right, at least on the uh, public performance side, and so we've got it covered. And that certainly was what our negotiators thought and what Congress said, uh, or the uh, the House report said, but uh, as it turns out, things got more complicated. Partly because of this same issue of does, is there a public performance uh, if there hasn't been a performance? Uh, if there is an offer to make a performance of a work available, does that trigger the public performance right? Or do you have to have actually performed the work, i.e. do you actually have to have transmitted a, a performance of the work. It's long been clear that it is not necessary to prove that a transmission was received. Back in the old days, if uh, the radio is transmitting um, popular music, musical compositions, it was not necessary to prove that anybody actually turned on the radio and received the transmissions. Uh, and I, I can, I, when I was an undergraduate, I worked at the college radio station, and I'm sure that there were days when I was broadcasting classical music that nobody turned on the radio. <laughs> Nonetheless, that was, a, that was a public performance by transmission. But in those instances, that's push technologies. There was a transmission. Uh, what happens where there isn't yet a transmission? Uh, do you, um, the, is the public performance right triggered if there hasn't actually been a transmission. Uh, you, it's one thing to say recipients, it's another thing to say the act of transmission. Um, and I think that this 
problem might actually be more theoretical than practical for the practical reason that you can get an injunction against prospective conduct. It may be that merely offering to stream a work without actually streaming the work will not give rise to an award of damages, but if you offer to stream a work, that is a prospective violation of the right. So uh, you should be able to get that conduct enjoined. And as is often the case in copyright cases, what you want is the injunction. So it may not be as significant a problem as, uh, as, as first appears. But here's the real, this is the significant problem, Cablevision and its spawn area. Uh, the, the Second Circuit in 2008 came up with a very, um, I think, bizarre interpretation of the Copyright Act uh, in a case involving RSDVR, that is, uh, the uh, a remote video recording technology. It, Cablevision would distribute a program guide to its subscribers and it would say these programs are available for deferred viewing. So you tell us what you want to see later, and we will record it. We will store it in your individualized storage area on our servers at our headquarters in Long Island. And when you want to see the program, you tell us, and we will transmit it to you. The particularly Baroque feature of the Cablevision uh, RSDBR service was that Every subscriber had his or her own personal storage area on the servers. So if you had 50,000 subscribers, each subscriber, you had 50,000 little storage areas, that, which makes zero sense from an engineering point of view, uh, but it makes some sense or it made some sense from a copyright point of view. Because if you are communicating a work from a centralized copy, the court said that that is a public performance, but uh, the way Cablevision set up its uh, remote DVR service, the court said uh, there's two different acts here. One is recording the program, recording it on demand, and the second is transmitting it back on demand. Uh, the recording, although it is residing on the server in Long Island, is actually made by the subscriber. Uh, now, of course, technically it's made by Cablevision, but the, the court said that uh, the, the volition to make the copy is the subscribers. Cablevision is just offering the service, is totally automatic, and they'll do what you tell them. So you know, nobody here but us computer parts. Uh, and the Second Circuit bought that. They said that the copy is not made by the service, it's made by the subscriber and it is sitting in the subscriber's storage box. When it comes time to transmit the content back to the subscriber, that's not a public performance because only that subscriber will receive a transmission from that storage box. That's why you have 50,000 or more of them, right? Because if you had the Second Circuit looked at the statute and said uh, whether the members of the public capable of receiving the performance or display receive it. What's the it? The Second Circuit says the it is the transmission from the source copy. Uh, and only one member of the public is capable of receiving a transmission from the source copy that is sitting in the subscriber's personal storage locker. So even though Cablevision may be offering that same content to 50,000 people, sending, the, sending it at different places, different times, because it's 50,000 separate copies, they're all 50,000 private performances. They're not public performances. Uh, when, when the Second Circuit came out with this decision, the Supreme Court denied cert, uh, there were a number of predictions that this was a roadmap for uh, all kinds of interesting business models. So that's why you have in red uh, the, uh, the 
conclusion that one can draw from Cablevision, just set it up so that you have uh, one copy, one source copy per subscriber. The transmission from that source copy won't be up to the public because it will only go to that one subscriber. The Second Circuit essentially bought uh, the metaphor that you should think of the Cablevision service as a DVR in the sky. If you could do it at home, you can do it, and some company can commercially do it for you in the sky. The, that was the winning metaphor. These tech cases often are wars of metaphors. So the, the broadcaster's metaphor was, this is video on demand. You're telling Cablevision what you want to watch and when you want to watch it. Video on demand is clearly a public performance. But that metaphor lost, and the DVR in the sky metaphor prevailed. So, Keeping that in mind, we got new businesses. Uh, these are the antennas of Aereo. And this is how Aereo works. Aereo is, builds on the Cablevision model. It offers, or offered, uh, to make uh, available streaming, uh, uh, see, broadcast television, which would be streamed to your device. And in order to do that, they gave every subscriber an antenna. That antenna, as you saw at the very beginning, whoop, that's how big it is. It's the size of a dime. So every subscriber gets an antenna. Well, not quite. Every subscriber gets space on the antenna because, in fact, uh, there's no two subscribers at one time on the same antenna. But you don't actually have your uh, antenna. You can't go to their headquarters in, in Brooklyn and sort of pick out which one of those is your antenna. Nonetheless, the, 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 it was the same principle as Cablevision, which is when you tell them, they send you a program guide, you tell them what you, what you want to watch. But in this case, it's not time deferred. It's watch TV now. So, but you want to watch it on your cell phone uh, or your, your laptop. They will uh, tune your antenna to the signal corresponding to that program. Uh, it then gets, that signal gets digitized. Uh, it spends a small amount of time in your personal storage box uh, and goes then thence to your device. So the same setup is you have as many you have as many antennas, as many um, storage, uh, storage copies as there are uh, subscribers, and therefore only one subscriber can receive that transmission from that copy. So the broadcasters bring another lawsuit. And the, the broadcasters, they obviously weren't happy with uh, Cablevision, which they thought of as an end run around video on demand. Interestingly, though, Cablevision, having scored this great victory in its case, was very unhappy with Aereo. And there's uh, a pretty clear reason, especially if you're a New Yorker, which is where Aereo started, why the cable folks didn't like Aereo. And Cablevision actually joined up with the broadcasters in the litigation. Um, a cable package in New York is really, really expensive. And it contains a lot of stuff that most people are not interested in. But in New York, you cannot get a clear over-the-air television signal because of all the interference. So a lot of people subscribe to cable and are gouged by Time Warner or whoever, uh, even if all they want to watch is broadcast television. So Aereo was a fabulous service. You, quote, cut the cord, you stop subscribing to your cable company, and you can get uh, the... Uh, you can get over-the-air television on a digital device, and that way you, uh, you get a good quality signal and you don't have to deal with cable. So the, the Cablevision realized that the, uh, it had sort of created a monster <laughs> because the, uh, the, the, the whole setup, the, it was their setup, and Aereo just adapted their setup for a service that uh, was perceived as a significant competition problem for, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the cable services. So uh, it went up to the Supreme Court. The district court said, I'm bound by cable vision. The Second Circuit said, declined the invitation to say it was wrong in cable vision, so it, can, it affirms, goes up to the Supreme Court. 
uh, which decides 6-3. In a somewhat unusual lineup, because the case had been portrayed as all those mastodontic copyright industries against the nimble lith tech industries, uh, and uh, Justice Breyer has, in most of the tech cases, been perceived as aligned with the tech industries. He writes the majority opinion, overturning the, um, the uh, area. Uh, I, was, I would have liked to have said overturning ca cable vision, but m maybe not. Uh, so overturning area. Two questions. Uh, who performs? The Second Circuit said that cable vision made the copies, but it didn't decide who performs, because one could make the same argument that the volition to engage in the performance is not on the services part, they're just responding automatically to the request, rather uh, it's the volition is on the part of the customers of the service. The Second Circuit ducked that by saying, we don't have to get into that because in any event, it's whoever is performing, it's not a public performance because it's just one, uh, it's that one-to-one -one correspondence between the source copy and the um, uh, and the subscriber. The, second, the Supreme Court does, however, address both questions. Is, who performs in this service and is it to the public? So uh, I think that the, the court, well, it's pretty clear from the opinion, that the court was very persuaded that Aereo, it's, it's very much like cable television. Uh, and the, the argument that Aereo was making, nobody here but us providers of equipment, we're not, engaged the, we're not engaged in any retransmissions that come within the scope of the Copyright Act, that is the same argument that the cable companies made back in the 1970s when it was contended that when, when they captured first local signals and then distant signals and relayed them to the subscribers, it was argued that those are retransmissions that are a form of public performance. The cable operators said, no, no, we're just providing equipment. You should, you should conceive of this as like an antenna, rabbit ears antenna, that the subscriber finds the tallest local mountaintop, puts her antenna on top of the mountain, runs a really, really long cord from the mountain to her home in order to get the cable signal. And the Supreme Court actually agreed with that analysis and said that the cable companies were not performing, they were just providing equipment. Uh, and Congress overruled that in the 76 Act and clearly brought cable operators, cable retransmissions within the scope of the Copyright Act. They also provided for uh, a statutory license, but on the front end question of is it a public performance, is the cable service performing? Answer, yes. So the majority says, Aereo, it's, they're making the same arguments. They're, they're also making the, the antenna on top of the mountain argument. And uh, Congress has now discredited that. Can't really, Aereo is too much like cable to not be performing. By contrast, uh, the, the dissent uh, argued that Aereo lacked volition. They, the majority doesn't say anything about volition. The, the, uh, the dissent says it lacks volition, and uh, if, if there's anything going on here, it is at most a question of contributory infringement, not a question of direct infringement. There is no performance. Therefore, the dissenters never got to the question of whether the performance was public, because they said it wasn't a performance in the first place. So the remaining six go on to the question of whether uh, what Aereo is doing is a public performance. Uh, and there, the court interprets that transmit clause quite differently from the, uh, from the way the Second Circuit had. Because the Second Circuit said the it, the it is the individual transmission, and the Supreme Court says no, it's the performance of the work. So the fact that Aereo might send that work uh, in 20,000 separate transmissions, it's still a public performance. It's still a performance to the public. And in that respect, uh, the area decision is very similar to a decision just a few months before by the European Court of Justice in the TV catch-up case, which was basically the same thing. And the, uh, the uh, European Court of Justice held that that, that setup was uh, a, 
uh, communication to the, the public. The fact that the, that the members of the public receive the communication as individualized transmissions rather than as one mass transmission doesn't matter, it's still to the public. Indeed, uh, the real problem with the Second Circuit's interpretation saying that if it's individualized, it's not to the public, is that that reads out of the statute the different times part because you, if uh, it, the members of the public can't receive the same transmission if they're receiving it at different times. To, require, to say that there's not a public performance unless members of the, of the um, public receive the same transmission means that asynchronous transmissions aren't covered, and that's just wrong. And the Supreme Court recognizes that that's just wrong, which is why I gave you the, the language. And they also uh, observed that uh, the, if Aereo's interpretation is correct, then it wouldn't take much for other businesses to Aereoize their transmissions to make everything an individualized transmission, uh, whether simultaneous or asynchronous because the cost of computer storage space keeps going down. It may seem absurd to have 100,000 or however many separate transmissions when you could just have one transmission or fewer transmissions for purposes of a, a, asynchronous, um, but uh, you, could, you could afford to do it if the consequence of doing everything as an individualized transmission is it becomes copyright free. So the court actually understood that. Uh, and, and said that uh, and rejected the Second Circuit's interpretation of the, what it means to perform publicly. Uh, that said, the court said a, f a few things about uh, what uh, who the public is that could come back to to haunt us. The act suggests that the public consists of a large group of people outside of a family and friends. Do they really mean that? Do they mean that you? that there's no public transmission, uh, public performance, unless you have transmitted the work to a large number of people. They can't mean that. Uh, they can't mean that because uh, that, that would mean that you wouldn't know if you had a public performance until you counted the number of people who received the transmission. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In fact, that would lead to another kind of aerialization because you could imagine that the company would, would figure that uh, based on prior case law about what is open to the public, if, you ha if anything less than, I'm making this up, 100 people is not a substantial number of persons. Right. Then you just set up your business so that you transmit to 100 people, no more than 100 people, and then you transmit to the next batch of 100 people, no more than 100 people. And so you have a whole bunch of, of transmissions not to a large number of people. That can't possibly be right. So I think that one has to understand the Supreme Court as uh, going beyond actual transmissions to the offer to transmit. If you are offering to transmit to a substantial number of people, then that comes within the concept of the public for purposes of to perform publicly. Now, admittedly, some features of Aereo uh, could give rise to some concerns because if the, uh, the re relevant reference point is not the transmission from a single source copy or from however many source copies, but rather the work. What happens if the company uh, has a bunch of subscribers, all of whom are requesting the same, happen to be requesting the same work at the same time, even though the work might not even have been proposed by the service. This is the Dropbox theory that uh, you, I assume all of you are familiar with Dropbox or similar. Right? So, you put things in Dropbox, mostly your things, but you might be putting third-party copyrighted content uh, into your Dropbox, and then you access uh, your, that content on demand. Well, if a substantial number of persons are requesting access to the same third-party copyrighted con content, does that suddenly become a public performance on the part of Dropbox? Uh, and the Supreme Court 
while saying that wasn't deciding anything except for Aereo, uh, said a few things that I think were designed to let Dropbox sleep easily at night. Uh, because uh, it first it tried to distinguish the Aereo situation from uh, subscribers who are acting in their capacities as owners or possessors. Nobody knows what that means because it doesn't make sense. Uh, you can't be, the subscriber is not an owner or possessor of the copyright, that, that belongs to the author or to some other copyright owner. They're not the owner or possessor of a hard copy. So it's not clear what the court means. I think they mean that, they, that there's some possessory relationship or some legal relationship between the subscriber and the content. So you have a license, you have a, iTunes, you have a license to, to listen to that content, to put it on multiple devices and access it in different places. Um, uh, but the court was remarkably imprecise <laughs> with that language. Uh, what I think the court was getting at was, I think, a, a more common sense question, which is, what is the public paying for? With Aereo, the public is paying for retransmissions of live television. It, that's what cable is all about. Um, with uh, Dropbox, the public is paying to store stuff. The public isn't, of course, they're also paying to, to be able to access the stuff that they store, but it's, uh, Aereo, excuse me, Dropbox is really not implicated in any specific content the way Aereo, or I would argue Cablevision is. Uh, so that's why I think Dropbox, uh, the, the opinion I think pretty well excludes Dropbox and at the international level, that's okay. I think that Dropbox really could be considered a mere equipment provider and the agreed statement to Article 8 of the WIPO Copyright Treaty does uh, try to clarify that simply providing the equipment, the physical facilities for communication, doesn't make you a participant in the communication. So I think the Dropbox paradigm is uh, both as a matter of interpreting how the Supreme Court has interpreted the public performance right and as a matter of international norms, they're okay. But to conclude, what about Cablevision, those RSDVRs? Uh, is, that, uh, is Cablevision making works available to the public in the international sense? Is Cablevision uh, violating the public performance right in the US sense? At the international level, there have been a fair number of cases uh, in Europe, but also in Japan, that uh, have involved uh, variations on the RSDVR and that have been held to be forms of making available to the public, communication to the public, reproduction uh, and distribution, well, not distribution, but reproduction. Um, uh, and so I think that uh, one could argue that the emerging international interpretation uh, would consider that those uh, deferred time-shifting business models are making available business models. In the US, the Supreme Court was quite adamant that it wasn't going to decide Cablevision, uh, that that case was not before it, that the Solicitor General had said, you don't have to decide it, and the Supreme Court said, the Solicitor General told us we didn't have to decide it, we're not gonna decide it. Uh, but uh, Aereo raises a lot of questions about whether that, where that business model falls. So I think I will leave it at that, and we still have 45 minutes for Q&A. That's great. Thank you very much. We have some time now for your comments, questions. Everybody's shell-shocked. <laughs> yes, Andrea. Do you want to If you could identify yourself for the purpose of the recording, Andrea. Sorry, if you could just speak I'm, into I'm Andrea time. Rush, a longtime fan, also on the Journal of the Copyright Society of the USA. So, I... I was wondering if you might give some comments on the uh, principle of technological neutrality and how that makes its way into helping either side in, in, um, in the conversation. Um, 
Okay. Well, I, I suppose the first question is, is there a principle of technological neutrality? I, I think that we all like, we, we, we like to think that one's uh, rights and, for that matter, limitations and exceptions should not be technologically specific. Uh, and that is often but not always true. And certainly the United States Copyright Act is riddled with technologically specific provisions. They are usually the most obsolete as well as the most impenetrable. But even the Berne Convention has technological uh, specificities. So uh, I, I, I have some, some questions about whether the premise is true as a matter of fact. I think what one can say is that what What's really troublesome about Cablevision and Aereo is that it makes the law turn entirely on technological design. Uh, and if one were to step back and say, what, what is the nature of the service that is being offered? We might disagree about whether deferred time shifting is or should be a form of making available. But let's talk about it at the level of what is the service that's being offered, not what are the software means of, of bringing that service to, to you. Because if you make things turn on technological design, uh, there are a lot of people who are much smarter than lawmakers or judges who will figure out how to design something to fall within whatever the roadmap that the, the court has laid out. That's what happened with, with Cablevision. Uh, so maybe it would be better to, to have the discussion at the policy level of whether, uh, I guess to be mo most straightforward about it, wh whether, the, whether Sony is, should still, uh, is still good law or should still be good law. And, and then we'll, we'll work it out from, from there. But if, if we, we try to work it out kind of from the, the, the bottom up, from the guts of, the, of, of, of how the service works, I think we're just going to get hopelessly lost. Uh, Mara Tofik, thank you very much. That was really excellent. I'm just curious, given what you said about the, the courts and their, the, the Supreme Court, particularly in its attempt to try and deal with making available through either sort of the distribution of here, the public performance, right? If you anticipate sort of um, that these, these decisions or sort of the uns maybe unsatisfactory conclusions might prompt Congress to enact a making available right? Um, well, the Copyright Office has uh, held a hearing, has actually held a couple of hearings on the making available right. Ha uh, have we really implemented it? What are there, there are gaps between what the international norm is and where, where we are? And uh, do, we need a, do, do we need congressional intervention or just better, quote unquote, uh, judicial interpretation? I think that the inclination has been that this the courts made this mess, they can unmake this mess, that Congress really did uh, enact a pretty broad statute back in, in 1976. And the, the, the problems that I have mentioned, although I said we've got problems at the level of Congress and at the level of the courts, I think it was more on the level of the courts than uh, with respect to the, the text of, of the Copyright Act. Thank you. But can, you enacted a making available right in Canada. Yeah, I mean, and our courts kind of grappled with the problem, and we had tried the, the issue of, you know, our statute was drafted in a way that was sufficient, sort of the approach that the United States had taken. And in this last round of revisions, we actually enacted the provision. But we tend to be, I mean, we didn't have an equivalent um, in terms of the, the section you, you produced there about sort mm -hmm. of the. The, um, the transmission through any device. We didn't have anything really like that. And that, may, that is significant, I think. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, yes. Hi, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm Caris Craig. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to work out really where to begin because there's an awful lot of stuff that's very interesting to me in what you've said and then there's a lot that I think raises questions for us in Canada just in terms of the interpretation of the law and our understanding of the making available right. Um, so 
But I think I'm going to ask uh, a bigger question, which is really just a policy question for now, which is to say one gets the sense that, I mean, technological neutrality is a principle in Canada that has been articulated by our Supreme Court. And so we do have, I think, now a clear sense that we don't want to be looking inside technologies to find out exactly what technological processes are occurring within them, but rather we should treat new technologies as a kind of black box. What goes in, what comes out, that's really what we should care about. And then we should look at functional equivalence, we should look at policy, we should look at the purposes of copyright law to work out um, an answer to any particular case. Um, it seems to me that one of the problems that we're trying to fend off is that whenever a new technology presents itself, it presents new opportunities for exploitation. And then you have the first movers, you have the, the, the people who spot those new opportunities, who make that new technology possible, who move into the marketplace and who offer it. And I think we've had, you know, for decades, for hundreds of years, a situation in copyright law where the established actors with commercial interests that are already vested in the old economy want to be the beneficiaries of whatever those new innovations are. And copyright law has sometimes permitted them to essentially become um, the new stakeholders by, by asserting their rights to, to basically block those innovators and to move into their spot in the new market. And I think there's a sense that we don't that this might be contrary to our larger policy purposes. We actually want innovation, we want new actors. And you know, you see the way that Cablevision turned in this case when suddenly they're facing competition. Is there something about the way that the courts have dealt with this series of cases and the sort of technological specificity of the responses that these cases have generated that is counter to our larger public policy goals of encouraging innovation and welcoming new actors into the marketplace? Well, I think you've just made a very strong argument for technological specificity. Be because if you, uh, if you really believe in technological neutrality uh, and you also believe, if it, or I don't want to say believe in, but you have exclusive rights, which are broadly phrased, right, to reproduce the work in any form, right, uh, the, uh, uh, then what, what that means is that if the new technology involves reproduction in any form, it comes within the exclusive rights of the, the copyright owner. And so in order for those innovators not to uh, come within um, the power of the copyright owner, you want a technological carve out. Uh, so I, I'm, I, th I think that, in, in fact, you, you've, you've got uh, two uh, pr principles that are in some tension with, with each other. Now, I suppose if you start with exclusive rights that are very narrowly phrased, then you don't have the, uh, the same problem. But then what you have is a problem of techn technological specificity, specificity at the level of the exclusive rights, as opposed to technological specificity at the level of the exceptions or carve-outs to the exclusive rights. But if, if you start uh, as, a, and I would say again at the international level, you're starting from uh, a, a set of exclusive rights that are broadly phrased and intentionally <laughs> broadly phrased be precisely because copyright is the product of new technology, the printing press. Uh, and every time a new technology comes along, it had been thought that the the copyright law has to keep pace otherwise the the law will become obsolete if we considered that the the reproduction right uh, covered only books in print format uh, along comes the ebook and is increasingly overtaking the print format if the uh, if copyright is not phrased broadly to cover reproduction regardless of, of form, then you're, you're going to have the, uh, the dwindling meaning, dwindling significance of copyright with the possible problem of dim diminishing incentives to create works in the first place. So uh, it's, uh, I, I think that the, the technological specificity can uh, work, kind of works both ways. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Rosalind Colada Cedra. I'm one of the students on the IP Osgood Intensive. I uh, have a question about the Charming Betsy Doctrine. I'm wondering uh, if you could speak a little bit to the motivation behind that and if you see any impetus to um, changing the approach to that in, in terms of perhaps taking a more generous view on what ambiguity would be in order to bring U.S. Mm -hmm. policies more into international mm -hmm. standard. Right. Uh, well, I assume that Canada must have an equivalent, but I don't know what it's called here. Somebody help out <laughs> on what, what your version of the Charming Betsy Doctrine is? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, it's it's called the Charming Betsy because it was an admiralty case, and admiralty cases bear the names of the ships. So the sh it's a decision by Justice Marshall. So it goes very the first Justice Marshall. So it goes back to to the early nineteenth century as a general. This is a general norm of of pub public international law, uh, and I mean it's you. It's, it's kind of at the international level, similar to what in the United States we call the doctrine of constitutional avoidance, which is uh, if a statute is, uh, has been alleged to be in conflict with the Constitution, rather than saying the statute is unconstitutional, we try to interpret the statute in a way that uh, keeps it consistent with, with the Constitution. So if there is ambiguity in the statute that will allow you to read the statute consistently with the Constitution, you take that reading, even if that may not be the most uh, obvious reading. And uh, again, well, that's been the tradition for the US Constitution for a, for a long time. And I think that the Charming Betsy Doctrine is just the same idea but in this case, the norm is not the highest document, in an internal document, but rather it's a multilateral document. Um, but you also, I assume you also have a doctrine like that. The, um, the Brit British courts, back before they, uh, they, they had any kind of, well, they, before they had judicial review, or before they could say that an act of parliament violated some uh, higher norm, like European charters, um, the uh, the tra technique of Parliament was, uh, I mean, of, of of the House of Lords was to say, this statute can't possibly mean that because if it, if it meant it, it would be in violation of our unwritten constitution of our fundamental norms. But it's, it's the same technique. You you try to read a document, even if it's on its face looks very problematic. You try to read it in a way that will avoid the conflict with the written or unwritten domestic or international law norm. Thank you. My name is Justice, first year PhD, and um, my thesis is actually focused on copyright and uh, with significant reference to um, um, law reforms of uh, copyright law in Canada. And um, my question is with re regards to you know, legislative technique, whether it should be specific or it should be neutral. Now, it seems to me like um, an unsettled area. If you want to say you have to be technology specific, there are particular challenges to that. What if you come up with a technology that is broader than that? You have to go and amend the law again. And then what if you say, okay, for, to avoid that, let us be neutral. It can become very vague, abstract, and difficult to deal with. So in between, can you have a hybrid of both techniques? Okay, this is an area where we can say, okay, let us try and be specific to an extent, and this is an area where we can say, okay, let us try and be neutral to an extent. What do you think a combination of both approaches would produce? Um, I, I guess I am skeptical about technologically specific uh, statutes. I, I, I acknowledge that the, that we have lots of them. That's why I'm skeptical uh, about them. Uh, that I mean, I think that the techno technological neutrality is desirable. Uh, I just am not sure that that it uh, so as a normative statement. Yes, as a descriptive statement, I have I have some doubts about the extent to which uh, our the, at least the U.S. copyright law uh, is technologically neutral. Now. Um, 
the can you have it both ways? I mean, the the problem. I think that the laws that work at a relatively high level of abstraction tend to last longer than laws that the more specific you get, the both the more likely that you will have obsolescence and the more likely that you're going to have this kind of engineering around that we saw in cable vision and, and area. Be, because if the uh, more specific leads to more loopholes. And loopholes are the invitation to sort of drive a truck through it. And, and that's, what, that's what we've just, just seen. The 1976 Copyright Act uh, by, started out with a, a number of rather broadly written uh, provisions that have lasted fairly well. And then uh, a whole lot of specific provisions the, the balance uh, tended to be, and some would criticize this, that the broadly written provisions were on the rights side and the specifically written provisions were on the exceptions side. So we have uh, section 106 says subject to sections 107 through 122, the exclusive rights of the copyright owner are X, or we've got uh, uh, six ex exclusive rights. Uh, and then, but there's section 107, fair use, which is nice and broad, and, and uh, that's good. That's operating at the level of principle. But then you get section 108, which is for libraries, that is totally out of date. Uh, and, and you just, you keep going. And as you keep going, they get longer and more specific and more tortured. And uh, they tend not to work very, very well. Uh, I suppose that one, if, if one were being uh, kind of cynical about this, you could say that that's actually okay to have it both ways, to have broad principles and hopelessly tangled uh, exceptions, which tend to be technologically motivated, because what those problematic provisions, the ones that are impenetrable, uh, they're going to push people to bargain in a way that maybe the broad statements aren't pushing people to bargain. So that what we have is provisions that don't actually work on paper, but which have led to a bunch of business arrangements that maybe do work. Uh, I think that might be an okay consequence, but it's a really weird way to, to, to draft a law. So I, I don't think that I would want to adopt as a, as a principle of legislative drafting, come up with the most impossibly drafted law so that you force people to the bargaining table so that they can work out a modus uh, vivendi outside the, uh, the text of the law. Okay. I have a second question. Um, it's with regards to the US implementation of uh, moral rights. Um, I can't remember clearly, but I think there's a case, the Monty Python case, that decided in favor of moral, you know, U.S. implementation of uh, moral yeah. rights. Yeah. So do you think that's like um, a good step? It would have been if the Supreme Court hadn't driven a stake through its heart. Uh, <laughs> the Monty Python case was actually uh, both a copyright and a trademarks case. The it concerned the American broadcast of uh, several episodes of Monty Python, which, uh, when broadcast on commercial television, had uh, were edited in order to make room for the commercials, and therefore became totally incomprehensible, even for people who don't get British humor in the first place, who <laughs> was even worse. Uh, and Monty, Monty Python said, this is an unauthorized adaptation. Uh, it's a derivative work. The Copyright Act gives us the exclusive right to authorize derivative works. We held on to the copyright in the scripts. And the BBC, our deal with the BBC was that they wouldn't change the programs. And when ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, got a license from the BBC, they could not make changes because the BBC 
could only give ABC the rights that it got from Monty Python. If it didn't get the right to make changes from Monty Python, BBC can't give that right to anybody else. That's a basic principle of contract law, not just copyright. You can only grant what you've got, and they didn't have that right. That's the copyright part. That's still good law. The only problem is that lots of people, lots of authors don't still have those, those rights. The other argument in Monty Python was that by broadcasting the truncated versions as Monty Python's Flying Circus, when it really wasn't Monty Python's Flying Circus anymore, it had been mutilated, it gave a false impression of uh, Monty Python's approval of the program. That was under Section 43A of the Lanham Act. And so when we joined the Berne Convention, uh, we referred to the Monty Python case and said, OK, we don't have a formal right of integrity, uh, but what we've got is we've got a patchwork. We've got the, the derivative works right. We've got defamation claims. And we have this wonderful Section 43A action. But in a case called Daystar, the Supreme Court said that 43A doesn't apply to intellectual goods. So. That's what I mean by driving a stake through the heart of, of Monty Python. Professor Gainsbourg, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. My name is Meenakshi, and I'm one of the IB Osgoods intensive uh, program students. My question is about the, if you can speak something about the split decision, uh, you know, the majority as opposed to the dissent, and specifically, I'm uh, seeking your opinion on you, s you it originally or you at the beginning of the topic you suggested the minimalist approach in the US at the level of the Congress and at the level of the um, of the judiciary is it fair to say that it is hard to find a discussion uh, based on ideologies and you know the the foundations of intellectual property law at the level of the court uh, is it more really towards uh, interpretation of the law and by them, and we really cannot have a good debate on those uh, intellectual property reforms from the bench? Uh, I don't think that the court uh, or courts, that there's an ideological divide uh, on, on copyright. In academia, there certainly is. But uh, I, I don't think that it breaks down left, right, uh, on, on copyright cases, and if you just look at how the the court has decided copyright cases, I don't think you you could predict alignments or or even uh, the. I think I think in in the the blogosphere, people were just assuming that since Justice Breyer had held for or had had written uh, dissents or concurrences on the, the tech side that he was going to be a vote uh, for, for area. Well, no, it didn't, didn't, didn't work out that way. I suppose that some people might say, well, um, Justices Scalia and Alito and Thomas, they believe in property. So they must believe in intellectual property. So that means that they're going to be with the, the broadcasters. Well, no, it's a, it, just, it doesn't. It's, I think this is one where you really can't predict it. Hi, sorry, me again. Um, just a quick question about your interpretation of Article 8 in the first instance. Um, and whether there's any scope for suggesting that it really, uh, the making available right really only um, relates to public performance uh, or performance to the public and, uh, and not to the distribution of copies. Um, we have in Canada a focus here when we look at the language not on these works but rather any communication to the public. And our Supreme Court has said, well, communication to the public is a public performance right, and therefore it doesn't implicate uh, the reproduction um, right. And so we might say, well, we've got the making available right covered off because we, we mm -hmm. protect um, the right to communicate to the public by telecommunication um, without worrying about whether something's being made available to be downloaded by somebody. Mm -hmm. The reproduction right will take care of that. Uh, well, that depends on um, how you, you're interpreting the reproduction distribution rights. Uh, the uh, Article 8 doesn't require that one, uh, that even if you have a quote making available right, uh, 
I suppose that it doesn't have to include digital distribution as long as digital distribution is covered somewhere else. Uh, distribution, not only actual distribution, but offers to distribute. Uh, and, and as I understand it in Canada, it's that piece of it that offers to distribute. That there's some ambiguity about whether that's actually covered um, by either the making available right that has been enacted in Canada, but whose scope, as far as I can tell, has not been adjudicated yet, um, uh, or whether a, di a distribution right would cover the, um, the offer to, to, to distribute. I think that in the WIPO text, it's clear that uh, making available in the sense of Article 8 covers both downloads and streams, not only because the text says the work rather than a performance of the work, uh, but also because in the WIPO Copyright Treaty, Article 6 is the distribution right and it's only physical copies. So, and there's an, I think there's an agreed statement that also makes clear that it's only physical copies. So the only way that you would get the distribution of digital copies covered and it's clear that this treaty was meant to cover them, would be in, the, um, in Article 8, that to understand that Article 8 covers both streams and downloads. But that doesn't mean that every member state has to uh, cover both streams and downloads through a single article, right? uh, as long as they're covered, both actual streams, actual downloads, and offers to stream and offers to download. done a lot of work on fair use. Uh, the conference uh, we were at, you spoke about fair use. And here in Canada and in many other countries, there continues to be a preoccupation, if not a fascination, with fair use. So I was wondering if you wanted to touch a bit about that and maybe its tension or relationship to some of the issues you raised with the making available, right? Just, uh, you have carte blanche. Oh, well, I, I don't know that I would try to tie it into the making available right. I, mean, I think that there's a separate question whether uh, fair use in the United States has so much expanded that maybe we've gone beyond the limits of the three-step test. And, and that's, a, that's a fair question. Uh, although I think there, there have been a couple of recent decisions that have reined back a little bit. Uh, it, in, in the United States, as you probably know, uh, the, the courts have been substituting for our four-part, four-factor test, a single factor called transformative use. Right? If the use is, quote, transformative, then the chances of it being a very a fair use are immense because uh, although transformative used to be kind of a gloss on the first factor, nature and purpose of the use, um, and used to mean what we used to call productive use, that is, have you quoted from uh, a prior work in a new and independent work of biography, criticism, parody, works that, that build on without being adaptations, without invading the derivative works, right, but works that build on their, their predecessors. So we were talking about uh, when Judge Laval coined the term trans transformative use, it was in the context of a transformative work. That has been s slowly morphed into transformative purpose, which might mean that the defendant's uh, use does not involve creating a new and independent work. It may actually be a form of redistribution of the, uh, of the original work. But if it's considered to have a transformative purpose, then the courts have said uh, that if it's a transformative purpose, it's not going to the market for the original work. It's a transformative market. And a transformative market, whatever that means, somehow does not have a deleterious impact on the market for or value of the original work. So everything we got bundled up into transform. If you could call it transformative, you won. Uh, and at that point, I think one could raise the question of whether we the 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 our architecture of the three-step test, certain special cases, I think we were no longer having certain special cases uh, that do not conflict with a normal exploitation of, of the work. Well, I'm not sure we were 
really consistent with that anymore um, and do not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of, of, of the author. Well, I, I think that some of the recent fair use case law was getting pretty close to the line there. There have been two recent decisions that suggest that maybe we're, uh, uh, that, that that has hit its high point, maybe. One is Judge Easterbrook, just a couple of weeks ago, issued a, uh, a strong, short, pithy, but strongly worded decision saying that there is no basis in the law for this transformative. He still found it was fair use. It was, it was a, involved a, uh, a, a t-shirt uh, that had taken a photograph. It was a, in, in the context of political debate and probably was fair use in any event. But let's, if we're, it, it, the, the tempering or tamping down, quelling transformative use doesn't mean we don't have fair use anymore. We just have fair use the way it was originally designed. The most recent decision, which was just this past week or two, um, involved uh, some a, uh, a defendant who had taken 70% of the Merriam-Webster's dictionary and put it in a free online website and said, this is a transformative purpose because I'm making it available to people, and, uh, access to culture. And the court said, no, that's not, there's nothing transformative about taking 70% of the dictionary and just putting it up on a website for open access for free. So maybe it suggests that, that some courts are recognizing that transformative had come to mean everything and nothing, right? or n'importe quoi, uh, and, uh, and that it was, was, was time to, to, to rein that in a little bit. But we'll see, it's just, just two, two, two decisions and we have had plenty of uh, pretty uh, amazing fair use decisions in the last couple of years. Okay, well, we'll end on that note. So we wanna give you a big round of applause and also thank you. Oh, thank you.